Welcome back, everyone. Ready for another deep dive? Today, we're tackling some serious particle physics, folks. Oh, yeah, we're going deep on this one. We've got a paper from 1964 by Murray Gell-Mann. You know, the Eightfold Way guy. Oh, absolutely. A giant in the field. Seriously. So this paper, a schematic model of baryons and mesons, it's in physics letters. Yeah. And it's where he first lays out this wild idea. Quarks. A game changer, that paper. To really appreciate it, though, we got to rewind a bit back to the 60s. Back when things were getting kind of crazy in particle physics, right? Totally. Physicists were discovering all these new particles left and right. It was a zoo. Gell-Mann, he was all about patterns, you know? Mm, yeah, the eightfold way organizing all those particles. Exactly. But he wasn't satisfied. He wanted to go deeper to figure out the underlying structure, the why behind those patterns. So he was basically searching for the universe's ultimate building blocks, like the tiniest Legos imaginable. Precisely. And one of his early ideas was this thing called the bootstrap model. The bootstrap model. Okay, I'm already lost. What is that? Well, imagine a universe where particles aren't really fundamental, but they're all just bound states of each other, kind of interconnected. It's a very dynamic picture. So everything's made of everything else. Sounds kind of trippy. Right. But even Gelman admitted it didn't quite explain everything they were seeing with those particle patterns. So the bootstrap model was a bust. What did he try next? He started looking at these unitary triplets. The idea that maybe these hypothetical triplets were the fundamental building blocks. At first, he considered triplets with whole number charges, like you see with protons. Okay, so plus one charge makes sense. But something tells me that's not the whole story. You got it. That didn't quite fit with the data. Then came the real breakthrough. Ooh, I knew there was a butt coming. Lay it on me. What was so groundbreaking about these triplets? He realized a more elegant solution involved triplets with fractional charges, and he called them quarks. He actually got the name from a line in Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. Quarks. That's unexpected. But fractional charges? That sounds like breaking the rules of physics. It was a radical idea. No one had ever observed fractional charges before. So what were these rule-breaking quarks like, exactly? Well, Gelman proposed they had some pretty unique characteristics. They have a spin of half, which is basically a measure of their intrinsic angular momentum. And they also have a baryon number of O, which is related to their role in forming heavier particles. Spin, baryon number, sounds complicated. Oh. But those fractional charges, that's the real mind bender. What were those exactly? He proposed charges of O, O and plus O. Okay, so we've got these weird fractionally charged quarks. But how do they build up the particles we actually see, like protons and neutrons? That's the beauty of it. He proposed that baryons, like protons and neutrons, are made of three quarks. Three quarks for a proton, got it. And then mesons, they're made of a quark and an antiquark pair. So different combos of quarks, like a recipe, create different particles. Mm. I'm starting to see the picture. But was this all just a brilliant guess, or was there some serious math backing it up? Oh, there was definitely math involved. Gelman, he based his model on field theory and symmetry principles, particularly something called SU3 symmetry. This mathematical framework let him organize particles into families and even predict new ones. Always a good sign in physics when you can predict something new. But how did this quark model explain things like weak interactions? You know, those processes that cause radioactive decay. Were quarks involved there, too? Now, that's where it gets really interesting. Gelman's model actually provided a pretty neat explanation for weak interactions. He connected his work to research done by a physicist named Kabibo, who'd proposed this idea of a weak current to describe these interactions. And the Kabibo angle, it basically measures how strongly quarks interact through this weak force. Okay, so quarks are not just building blocks. They're players in these fundamental forces. Amazing. But if this model was so revolutionary, were all the physicists immediately on board? Or was there some pushback? Even Gelman himself was cautious. He wondered, what if quarks could exist independently, not just bound within other particles? Could we actually find them, isolate them? So the hunt was on for these elusive quarks. But if they couldn't exist on their own, how on earth were scientists supposed to find them? That sounds like a real challenge. Oh, it was. Physicists started looking for any sign of these fractional charges. They used particle accelerators, smashing atoms together at crazy speeds, hoping to knock those quarks loose. So they were basically trying to smash open the atom and see what popped out. Mm -hmm. Did they find anything? Well, no, not really. At least not at first. These early searches for free quarks, they came up empty. No fractional charges. So no free quarks, huh? Did that mean the whole idea was wrong? 
Not necessarily. It just meant things were a bit more complicated than initially thought. Complicated how? Well, remember, the model was doing a great job explaining other things. The properties of hadrons, you know, those particles made up of quarks like protons and neutrons, it was really good at predicting how those behaved. Okay, so it worked in some places, but not others. Right, and don't forget about the connection to those weak interactions like we were talking about, the ones responsible for radioactive decay. Oh, right, right, with the Kabibo angle and all that. So, more research into weak interactions. That kind of backed up the quark idea, didn't it? It definitely did. It was becoming pretty clear that quarks were playing a key role, not just in the structure of matter, but in these fundamental forces as well. Okay, so the evidence was piling up, even if no one could actually find a free quark. Yeah. But that whole no free quarks thing, mm. that had to be a real head scratcher, right? Yeah, absolutely. Physicists started to develop new theories to try to explain why quarks might be permanently confined within these bigger particles. Permanently confined, like they're stuck forever. What could possibly explain that? One of the best explanations came from a theory called quantum chromodynamics, QCD for short. QCD. Yeah, that sounds intimidating. Well, it is a complex theory, mm -hmm. but the basic idea is this. Quarks are bound together by a strong force, and this force, it's mediated by particles called gluons. Gluons. So they're like the glue that holds quarks together. Exactly. But here's the thing. The strong force, it actually gets stronger the farther apart you try to pull those quarks. Wait, so the harder you try to pull them apart, the stronger the force gets? That doesn't make sense. It seems counterintuitive, right. But imagine trying to stretch a really strong rubber band. The more you pull, the more it resists. And with quarks, eventually, instead of separating them, you just end up creating new quark and a quark pairs. So it's like a game of cosmic tug of war that you can never win. Perfect analogy. QCD provided a really solid explanation for why we don't see free quarks, and it's actually become a cornerstone of what we call the standard model of particle physics, our best current understanding of the fundamental particles of forces in the universe. Wow, so we've got quarks, gluons, this strong force, the standard model, <laughs> that's all starting to come together. But hold on a minute. Didn't Gell-Mann initially propose only three types of quarks? Up, down, and strange. You've got a good memory. And yeah, those three were all he needed to explain the particles I knew about back then. But as physicists keep digging deeper into that subatomic world, they found, you guessed it, more quarks. More quarks. How many were we talking? Well, in the 1970s, they discovered a fourth one called the charm quark. And then came the bottom quark and finally the top quark. So we're up to six different types of quarks now. Six quarks. It's getting crowded in there. But you mentioned the standard model being elegant. Mm -hmm. How can a model with six quarks, gluons, all these forces. Mm -hmm. How is that elegant? That's the amazing part. Even with all those different pieces, the standard model describes all the fundamental particles and forces we know of in a really concise, mathematically beautiful way. It's like finding order in the chaos. And it all goes back to Gell-Mann's revolutionary idea, quarks. This has been such a mind-blowing journey. We've come a long way from a confusing jumble of particles to this elegant but still kind of mysterious world of quarks and the standard model. It really shows you the power of scientific curiosity, doesn't it? Absolutely. We started with a puzzle. Why do particles have these specific properties? And that led us to quarks, these tiny confined building blocks. It's really changed how we understand the universe. But I have to admit, there's still a part of me that's a little hung up on this whole quark confinement thing. If we can never actually see them directly, how can we be absolutely sure they're real? That's a great question, and it really gets to the heart of how we think about scientific evidence, especially when we're dealing with something we can't directly observe. It's definitely hard to wrap my head around sometimes. It's like, I can see a chair, touch a chair, but quarks, they're always locked up inside other particles. How do we really know they're not just some mathematical trick? It's more than just the math working out, though. Think of it this way. We can't see the wind directly. Right. But we know it's there. Because we can see leaves moving feel it on our skin. Exactly. With quarks, it's kind of similar. We can't isolate them. But UT, their existence explains so much of what we do observe. So we're looking at the effects, the things they cause, rather than the quarks themselves. Precisely. Remember all those particle patterns Gell-Mann was puzzling over? The quark model explains those beautifully. And it predicts how particles behave in those high energy collisions we were talking about, the properties of atomic nuclei. 
things we can measure. And those predictions match up with what we see. They do. The model fits the data so well, it's hard to believe it's all just a coincidence. So it's like, if you've got a jigsaw puzzle yeah. and all the pieces fit perfectly together, that's pretty strong evidence, even if you can't see the picture on the box yet. That's a great analogy. It's indirect evidence, but it's incredibly strong. And the great thing about science is it's never set in stone. Right. If someone came up with a better model that explained everything without quarks, we'd have to reconsider. But for now, the quark model, it's the best we've got. Well, this has been an incredible deep dive. We started with a whole mess of particles, and we ended up in this elegant but still mysterious world of quarks and the standard model. Really makes you appreciate the power of human curiosity, doesn't it? Absolutely. We started with the simple question, why do particles have these specific properties? And that question led to this revolutionary idea, quarks, these tiny confined building blocks, and the search to understand them. It's really changed how we see the universe. And it's not over yet, right? There's still so much more to learn about quarks and what they can tell us about the fundamental nature of reality. Exactly. Physicists are still exploring the implications of the quark model, looking for new particles, trying to understand the deepest levels of matter. Who knows what amazing discoveries are still out there? Maybe someday we'll even find a way to directly observe these elusive quarks. Now that would be a game changer. But even without actually seeing them, the way they influence so much of what we know is incredible. I think a good question for our listeners to ponder is, if something can be so fundamental, yet forever hidden, what does that really tell us about how we define real? Yeah. What else might be out there influencing our universe in ways we haven't even begun to grasp? It's a great question. And it's that constant questioning, that drive to understand, that keeps science moving forward. It really does. Well, thanks for joining us on this journey into the heart of matter. And until next time, Keep those minds curious.